Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 59. I think it is very safe to say that we are a nation that is separated from God. Those are sober words. Those are solemn words. I don't say them with a smile or with any cheer. But I think the truth needs to be spoken at the onset of this sermon. On this Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, we have chosen and embraced this path as a nation proudly. Just to be very current, before we read Isaiah 59, I encountered three pieces of media this week that confirm this. Three pieces of media that are just heartbreaking and disturbing, to say the least. The first one focused on the new mayor of New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio, and his shocking and morally reprehensible war on the unborn. The new mayor, in this article, has promised to work aggressively as the mayor. But he has promised to work aggressively to shut down crisis pregnancy centers, which he calls, quote, sham clinics. Pregnancy crisis centers, like we just prayed for, offer women free financial, logistical assistance to keep their babies or to place their babies with adoptive families. He wants to shut them down. Not shut down abortion mills. Not shut down crack houses, not houses of prostitution or gambling dens, but rather to shut down one of the few places in the city of New York dedicated to saving the life of the innocent. Now here's the thing, New York City has been called the abortion capital of the world. The city has some of the laxest restrictions and highest abortion rates in the country, with 41% of pregnancies in New York City ending in elective termination via abortion. 41%. According to New York Magazine, 10% of all abortions happen in the state of New York itself. 10%. 7 out of 10 abortions in the state take place in New York City. But those statistics are not high enough for Mayor de Blasio, who claims the city is, quote, underserved by its dozens of abortion centers, and for whom increased access to abortion was a key part of his campaign platform. And here's the shocking thing. 73% of New Yorkers put him into office. Kind of interesting, I saw a news clip on TV about the mayor, not about his stand on abortion, but about his stand on the famous horse-drawn carriages in New York City. I've ridden them a few times. His stand is this. The same new mayor says, quote, we are going to get rid of the horse carriages, period. They are not humane. They are not appropriate for 2014. So evidently, horses count and babies don't. And then I just read an interview this week in which the governor of New York State, Governor Cuomo, said during a conversation on the Capitol press room that those that are, quote, right to life have, quote, no place in New York, unquote. My friends, the cities lead the way. As the cities go, so goes the country. New York City is always just a few years ahead of the nation. And if you look at the high statistics of abortion in Pensacola, you would see we're right there trying to compete with them. The same laws in New York City that are in place today are celebrated throughout our entire country. And the question I want to ask is, could this sin separate us from God? It is one of our many national sins, but my friends, it is a profound one. So if you have a Bible, Isaiah 59, I want to read together verses 1 through 4, and then we will pray and ask for the Sovereign Lord's help in hearing His Word. Isaiah 59, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor His ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perversity. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words. They speak lies. They conceive evil. And they bring forth iniquity. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, we come today. We confess our hands are defiled with blood. Our fingers with iniquity. We confess we have not spoke loudly enough for justice. That we have not pleaded for truth as we should. And so today I pray again that our hearts would be heavy and burdened for our nation for the people of our nation, for the least of these in our nation, the innocent. 
And our God, I pray that your word would not return void this morning, but it would accomplish the purpose you have sent it forth for in our hearts. And we will give you praise as you work in the power of the Holy Spirit by the blood of Jesus Christ, in whose name we ask it. And God's people said, Amen. The prophet Isaiah speaks here, and he specifies the sins which the nation of Israel is guilty of in order to show the extent and the depth of their depravity, their fallingness. And he specifies the various parts of the body in chapter 59 to kind of help us understand just how defiled we are. You notice here he talks about the hands, the fingers, the lips, the tongues. He talks about more parts of the body throughout the chapter as the agents by which the sins are committed. He says, your hands are defiled with blood. The blood of the innocent. They were guilty of murder. They were guilty of violent oppression. They were guilty of cruelty. Now, by mentioning blood, he doesn't mean that they were literally just committing murders everywhere. Even though if you look at our nation and the murder statistics, it is truly unbelievable. Yet, by this word, he's talking about cruelty, extortion, violence, as well as murder perpetrated against the poor, the defenseless, the innocent that have been hurt by the nation. This is the sin of Cain, is it not? If you go to the beginning of the scriptures, you see Cain murdering his brother Abel. It is a sin in the beginning, and it is still a barrier that has separated us from God. In fact, in the beginning of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15, the prophet says, When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen, because your hands are full of blood. My friends, I'm at the point where I'm convinced that the prayers of our national leaders, the prayers that are done in Congress, are a sham. They are not heard from God because we are separated from God as a nation. And until there is true repentance, until there is true saving and sovereign grace by the hand of Almighty God, He does not hear us. Maybe He hears us intellectually because God is omniscient, He knows all things, but He does not hear America as a father hears a son or a daughter. We know this because Proverbs 6 says this, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to Him. And when we read in that list, one of the things is the hands that shed innocent blood. He hates that. Then the prophet wants to make it clear just how deep your hands have been stained with sin. He says, even your fingers are full of iniquity. It's not just the hands, but even the smallest part of your hand is free from injustice. You defile everything you touch as a nation, God is saying here. How do we apply this to our nation today? Well, there's murder, there is violent crime everywhere, but the most frequent committing of this crime, the most frequent shedding of the blood of the most innocent, most unfortunately, is not even a crime in our society. In fact, it is a celebrated thing. Our own president, just this last year, on the 40th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, said that Planned Parenthood, the leading force behind abortions in America, he announced God's blessing on Planned Parenthood. God's blessing on those who do this. Most Americans today are going to pay little attention to the fact that the 41st anniversary of what I believe the most horrendous, ghastly, destructive, society-destroying decisions ever made, Roe v. Wade, took place January 22, 1973. It will be, again, 41 years since the Supreme Court of the U.S. ruled that a woman has a constitutional right to arrange the termination of the unborn life within her. And, my friends, since that decision is handed down, more than 55,772,000 babies have been aborted. That averages out to 1.5 million abortions in America every year, 4,000 a day. One every 20 seconds, 120 babies will be murdered during this sermon you listen to today. All since the Supreme Court overturned the public conscience of our nation. So, let's compare this for a minute. The Civil War, 1861 to 65, one of the bloodiest on record in terms of the size of the armies involved. Close to perhaps 500,000 casualties. 55 million babies. In World War II, the U.S. suffered somewhat more than 400,000 deaths due to the conflict. 55 million babies. In Vietnam, hostilities, there were some 60,000 fatalities. You would need 933 Vietnam walls, enough to encircle the whole of D.C. more than once, 
to record those put to death by abortion. The infamous Holocaust engineered by the Nazis brought to death some 6 million people, many Jews and innocent people, 55 million babies. We went to war after the Japanese snuck attack Pearl Harbor causing the death of 2,300 Americans. We went to war after 3,000 Americans died September 11, 2001. We went to war with Afghanistan and Iraq for 3,000 deaths. We are talking 55 million abortions. Let that sink in for a minute. Rose human death toll exceeds the Nazi Holocaust, Stalin's purges, Pol Pot's killing fields, the Rwandan genocide all combined. Over the past 40 years, one-sixth of the American population has been terminated by abortion. One in four Americans is killed before birth. Our hands are stained with blood. In fact, here's a chart someone put together that demonstrates the distinction between the amount of deaths in every American war since 1775 and the amount of abortions in America. Absolutely mind-blowing and staggering. Abortion is now one of the most common surgical procedures performed on adults in America. As much as one out of three women will have at least one abortion in America in their lifetime in our generation. In some American neighborhoods, the number of abortions far exceeds the number of live births. Approximately 30% of all babies conceived in America are killed by abortion. Holocaust does not seem appropriate to me to use as a word to describe how our hands are full of the blood of the innocents. Our fingers are stained with iniquity. It's not strong enough to call this a holocaust. This is a mass murder. In some neighborhoods, a type of ethnic cleansing. Horrendous in the worst. You say, this doesn't affect me here in the Bible Belt of Pensacola and Escambia County. Well, the facts are you're wrong. According to the Florida Vital Statistics Annual Report, which, by the way, amazingly, they're not counting anymore the amount of induced terminations of pregnancy, abortions. They don't keep record of it anymore. But in 2007, they did. And in 2007, in Pensacola, there was 2,519 abortions in our city. If you look at verse 4 of Isaiah 59, it says there, No one calls for justice. No one opposes the acts of injustice which are being committed by the strong on the weak. There is no advocate for the weak. There is a love of litigation. There is a love of lawsuits. There is a desire to take advantage of the laws that are there. There are desires to appeal the laws and make them broader, not for the sake of having strict justice done, but for the sake of doing injury to others. They did not share God's heart for that which was fair and good. They actually thought in terms only of their own good and not in the terms of the good of the innocent. Why? Because the judges are corrupt. Because no one will speak on behalf of the weak. No one will bring offenders to justice. Because they call evil good and good evil. Isaiah 5.20 and then it says, no one pleads for the truth. All we see is falsehoods and lies prevailing everywhere. Everybody has their view on abortion. It is a woman's right. It is an issue of privacy. It is a state's right issue. It is a Supreme Court issue. You can't let your personal feelings get in the way. My friends, I want to know the truth. I want to know God's answer. I want to know what God's truth is about this most serious thing. So let me read to you a few passages of Scripture, and let's think on them for a minute. Psalms 139, verses 13 through 16. I'm going to read it out of the New American Standard Bible. It says there, You formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. I was skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. My eyes have seen my unformed substance. In your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. These are words that are deep. They are grand. They are majestic. They elevate life like nothing our country has ever done since Roe v. Wade. 
God, you have formed me. This is not of yourself. Formation of a child is not of parents. It is of God. God allows conception. God allows pregnancy. Every bone, every muscle, every artery, every nerve, every fiber of being, you have for me. It is the result of God. The infinite power and the wisdom of God are seen in the creation of a child in the womb. God is the creator of all life. Every strand of DNA that makes you who you are, that gives you your personality, your traits, your abilities, your talents, your gifts, that makes you look the way you are, your genetic code, all All of that, God is the creator who forms this. It says here, God covered me in the womb when you were hidden away as a treasure in your mother's womb until you saw light in your most secret condition, unborn. You were under the control and guardianship of God. Consider the Hebrew words used in these verses, these adjectives. We are fearfully made with reverence, honor, respect. That's what fearfully means. Let me ask, how many of us would get angry if we saw a pregnant mother smoking a cigarette and drinking an alcoholic drink? Would that be treating a child with reverence in the womb, fearfully, with respect? You know, we would get upset if a woman, we saw her very far along in her pregnancy, very evident she was pregnant, drinking and smoking at the same time. It would bother your conscience. And yet, I ask you today, does abortion treat the creative act of God with reverence and respect? We are wonderfully made. You see that adjective as well. To be distinct, to be marked out, to be separated, to be distinguished. We stand out. Each child is distinct, marked out uniquely in the creative order of God. Unique fingerprints, unique DNA, a unique soul, a unique personality. Marvelous are your works. The word marvelous has the idea of being beyond one's power. Something that is difficult for you to do. Extraordinary, hard, or difficult to accomplish. Who could dissect a portion of the human frame without marveling at its strength, and yet at the same time trembling at the frailty of the body? The body is a miracle of God's skill and power that will never be reproduced by human work. The composition of every part, yet the harmony of it all together as one unit. Every child a marvelous work of God. Creation is the work of God alone. I've used this illustration before, but I'd like you to hear it today. It's a true story of a professor of a world-acclaimed medical school who posed a medical situation, an ethical problem to his students. This is what he said. Here's the family history. The father has syphilis. The mother has TB. They have already had four children. The first child was blind. The second one died, and the third is deaf. The fourth has TB, and now the mother is pregnant again. The parents have come to you for advice. They are willing to have an abortion if you decide they should. What do you say? This is the question he ethically posed his students. The students gave various individual options. The professor asked them to break into small groups for consultation. All of the groups, without exception, came back to report. The consensus was they would recommend abortion. And then this very wise professor said, congratulations, you just took the life of Beethoven. I think that should make us pause for a minute and realize every life is fearful, wonderful, marvelous. People say, well, the baby is illegitimate. I want you to understand the fact is there are illegitimate parents. There are no illegitimate babies. Yes, your parents may not have planned you, but God did. Fearfully, wonderfully, marvelously. Job made the very same kind of a statement in Job chapter 31 verse 15. He said, did not he that made me in the womb make him? Did not one fashion us in the womb? The word made has the idea of making, preparing. In other words, God was preparing. We sometimes in fun say the baby's cooking in the womb. Well, God's the chef, okay? He's the one who's engineering this child, right? And preparing this child. The child was fashioned, fixed, accomplished. It is an abomination for our society to not recognize this. Steve Calvin has said these words, There is inescapable schizophrenia in aborting and destroying a perfectly normal 22-week fetus while the same hospital performs intrauterine surgery to save them on its cousin. At 22 weeks, one baby is dying, another baby is being saved. Babies survive on their own at 23 or 24 weeks, but abortion has always been legal beyond this limit. We think God fashioned and made this child in the womb. 
In our nation, it is unlawful to crush the egg of a bald eagle. And it's not unlawful to crush the egg of a human. No one would condone destroying a great work of art. Yet it's okay to destroy the greatest work of God. The crowning achievement of God's creation in Genesis was not the animals. It was not the heavens and the earth. It was man. And yet that is okay and acceptable in our world. Take a look at this picture. A picture of a fetus, to use medical terminology, 10 weeks old in the womb. And anyone in their right mind, after seeing this picture, would have to admit that this is not just a fetus. That might be the medical term, but that is a direct creation of God, a child with a soul born in the image of God, fearfully, wonderfully, marvelously made in fashion. Not just matter in the womb, a child that matters. Medical authorities determine a person to be alive if there is either a detectable heartbeat or brain wave activity. With that in mind, it's eye-opening to realize that unborn children have detectable heartbeats at 18 days, two and one-half weeks after conception. They have detectable brainwave activity 40 days into the pregnancy, a little over five and one-half weeks after conception. Yet, to our world, that is not a life. That is not a child. Ultrasounds show the unborn at eight weeks, sucking their thumb, recoiling from pricking, responding to sound. All the vital organs, including kidneys, intestines, brain, liver, are in place, and they are starting to function. The brain is functioning. The heart is pumping. The liver is making blood cells. The kidneys are cleaning fluids. There is a fingerprint. Virtually all abortions are later than this date. By 10 weeks, they are swallowing fluid. They are kicking up a storm. Nails are forming on the fingers. And toes and hair is growing on the tender skin. And the baby's limbs can now bend. And yet, essentially, 100% of all abortions occur after this point of pregnancy. Look at these three pictures. Seven-month-old baby in the womb. Amazing. Fearfully. Wonderfully. Marvelously created by God. I've been collecting special pictures to help demonstrate the inconsistency and hypocrisy of our nation in our stand on abortion. A lot of people get angry at pro-life advocates who stand on street corners, cross the street from abortion clinics, and they hold pictures of mutilated babies after an abortion. And we are called cruel. We are called mean-spirited for doing this. They say this is in bad taste. It is manipulative emotionally to show those pictures to moms who need to go make their choice. Yet, if there is a disaster in our oceans, if there is a disaster in the Gulf, it's not a problem for liberals to show dead sea otters or oil-slicked cranes or mutilated seals to show their cause, is it? Those pictures help people come to terms with what is really happening. So let me show you a collection. I haven't shown these for two years in our church, so I'd like to show them to you again. Maybe this will help you understand. Look at this picture. This is an elephant in the womb. The ultrasound at six months. If someone were to abort that elephant, every animal rights activist in this world would be up in arms because they would say that's a living elephant. Elephants are few and far in between. Here's another picture of an elephant in the womb, more detailed and graphic. Amazing. Amazing. How about this dog in the womb? On the top, 52 days. In the bottom, 63 days. People think you would be cruel to terminate such a precious little sweet dog in the womb just so the mom doesn't have to go through the birthing process. Here's another picture of a dog in the womb. For those of you who are Chihuahua lovers, there's a Chihuahua in the womb. And another Chihuahua in the womb. And another Chihuahua in the womb. How about this picture of a dolphin in the womb at 29 weeks? Again, oceanographers would be shocked and stunned that someone would enter the womb of the mother and extract this baby dolphin at 29 weeks and kill it. Here's another picture, more profound, a dolphin in the womb. How about a penguin in the womb? Look at that. Look at the close-up of its feet and its body in the womb. How about a horse? For those of you who are horse lovers, horse in the womb. Twins, polar bears, in the womb. A leopard, in the womb. Our society has a double standard, does it not? No one would ever allow any of these animals to have their lives taken, and yet every day it is celebrated as a freedom. We say, God bless Planned Parenthood. 
for their advising and manipulating young women to take the lives of children every single day. I love the words of the great preacher in Germany during World War II, minister Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He said, destruction of the embryo in the mother's womb is a violation of the right to live which God has bestowed upon this nascent life. To raise the question whether we are here concerned already with a human being or not is to confuse the issue. The simple fact is that God certainly intended to create a human being and that this human being has been deliberately deprived of his life and this is nothing but murder. We would say that about all the animals. Why in the world are we afraid to speak the truth about the unborn? Calvin said the fetus, though it's enclosed in the womb of its mother, is already a human being. And it is almost a monstrous crime to rob it of life which it has not yet begun to enjoy. It seems horrible to kill a man in his own house than in a field, because a man's house is his place of most secure refuge. It ought surely to be deemed more atrocious to destroy a fetus in the womb before it has come to light. We have laws in our society. If you kill a woman who is pregnant, you are charged with the murder of two, right? Not the murder of one. You remember the Scott Peterson case, very famous case, charged with the murder of two. And yet for a mother to do it makes it okay to take the safest place in the world, the, the secret dwelling of a child in a mother's womb, and to kill it is okay. The mother has consented to it. What does the Bible tell us about Jesus and children? Let's just hear some words from Christ for a moment. Jesus called a little child to him, and he set the child in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say unto you, unless you are converted to become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Then he says in chapter 18, verse 14, It is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. It's amazing. Jesus lifts up children. He honors children. Jesus says you must be born again. How much work did you do to be born the first time from your mother's womb? Right? Zero. This teaches the sovereignty of God. And you've got to be born again. God has to do this work in your life, in your heart. He uses the birth process as an illustration of the working of God in the gospel. He says He loves little children. Bring them to me. I don't want any of them to perish. And yet our society celebrates their perishing. It's a woman's choice. as an issue of privacy. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. And do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. He took them in His arms. He put His hands upon them and He blessed them. This was inconceivable for Greeks and Romans in the first century. Because of their pagan upbringing, they had no sentimentality toward children. Abortion and infanticide were frequent. Either they would kill the baby in the womb, or right when the baby came out, they would leave the, the baby to die on the side of the road, or they would even dash and kill their own children. There were too many mouths to feed in the empire. And so offspring were only good for one thing, the work in the fields, just as small as they could get them out there. The Jews treated their children better. Children were a gift of God. But yet, even to the Jews, children had no social standing. They were like women were treated in that society. They were better off seen and not heard. So the disciples thought Jesus had no business being bothered with children. And that little children were not a bother to Jesus. They're not a bother to God. He created them, formed them, marvelously fashioned them. He cares about their little cares and their big cares too. And I would say that we should care just as much as Jesus, Paul's, to care and to stand for the children. Calvin says here on this passage, those little children, they do not yet have any understanding to desire Jesus' blessing. They're little. Some of them are infants. And yet, they're presented to Jesus. He gently and kindly receives them. He dedicates them to the Father by a solemn act. In fact, Princeton theologian Charles Hodge says here, of such is the kingdom of heaven, lets us take part in thinking that maybe the great measure the population of heaven is composed of the souls of redeemed infants who have been murdered in this very, very way. I like what Spurge has said. He said, we hold that all infants who die are elect of God and are saved. We won't get into that doctrine this morning, but we believe that and affirm that as a church. He says that we look to this passage as being the means by which Christ will see the travail of his soul to a greater degree. I believe the Lord Jesus who said of such is the kingdom of heaven when he had those children does daily and constantly receive into his loving arms those tender ones who are only shown and then snatched away into heaven. 
I want to end by looking at Isaiah 59 again, if you have your Bible. This started off, and this is what it said. America, we have already very much clearly shown, is separated from God. Our hands are defiled with blood. Our fingers are full of iniquity. But look what it says in the beginning of these two verses before we close. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is His ear heavy that it cannot hear. He says, Behold! If you didn't hear everything I just said, wake up right now. This is emphatic. I need your attention. What I say deserves the notice and consideration of God's people and of the nation, the United States of America, just as much as it deserves the attention of Israel, as Isaiah says these things. The Lord's hand is not short that it cannot save. The hand is a symbol of power. I was driving down the road not too long ago. I saw a guy raise his hand because someone wouldn't start driving when the light turned green. He shook his fist. It was a threat. It was a sign of power, a sign of strength. And when someone shakes their fist at you, you know what that means. And he's saying here, the hand of God is not shortened. In other words, if your hand is shortened, it means you are cut off to accomplish what you want to do. God's people wonder why God did not seem to rescue them from the trials of the day of Isaiah. They wondered if perhaps God was diminished in his strength. Maybe he's not all powerful God anymore. Maybe he has been weakened. His hand has become shortened. And Isaiah is saying here, no, God has not grown weaker than in former times. He is still as omnipotent as He ever was. Ah, Lord God, You have formed the heavens and the earth by Your great power and Your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for You. The problem is not with God. We pray for revival. We have politicians and chaplains who pray for our nation publicly. And yet, there is a gaping inconsistency. God doesn't hear us, not because He can't work. Ephesians 3 says God is able to do exceeding abundant above all we can ask or think. The deficiency is not in God's hand, that He cannot save us, rescue and deliver us. Secondly, His ear is not heavy, that He cannot hear you. God does hear you as omniscient God. He intellectually knows the words we are saying. God is hearing is not dull and sensible. Some of you have hearing aids here because you're hearing deficient. God is not so. He hears the prayers of His people. He hears their cries. I can imagine some of the people of Isaiah's day said the problem is that God, He lacks power and He lacks knowledge and interest in our problem. That is not the situation at all. In fact, Isaiah 65 verse 24 tells us there that even before we pray our words, quote, before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. In other words, the idea of deism, that God is just the creator, He made the watch, He wound it up, and now He lets it go, and He doesn't intervene in the affairs of men, that is a lie. God can interfere in the affairs of men. His arm is still strong to save. His ear can still hear our prayers. The problem isn't with God's power, His knowledge, or His interest. Verse 2 through 4 tell us the problem. Our iniquity our sins have separated us from God. They have separated us. There was already an infinite distance between us and God by nature. We don't walk with God in the garden like in the past. Adam and Eve had the privilege of walking with God. We are separated by nature, but now sin as well has separated us. Sin separates us from fellowship with God. At the point of our sin, we no longer think like God does. If we don't take this seriously, we are not taking God seriously. Sin separates us from the blessings of God. Because at least at the point of our sin, we are not trusting God and relying on Him. Sin separates us from the benefits of God's love. You know, even if we are believers as a nation calling out to God, if we don't stand for truth and justice and cry out on behalf of the innocent whose blood is being shed, we are like the prodigal son. We are still loved by the Father, but we are far away in a distant land, and we are taking part of the slop of the world. We have bought it into the lie of the world. We are still loved by the Father, but we don't enjoy His benefits because of the sin of our silence. Sin separates us in some ways from the protection of God. Maybe our nation suffers. You know, people always talk about the judgment of God coming on our nation. I've said to you many times here, I believe the judgment of God is already on our nation. When we have 55 million babies who have been died, that is a judgment of God on us because we have rejected Him and His Word. It says, He has hid His face from you, verse 2. His face is hidden from us. As if He refuses to be seen or spoken with. The idea is that our sins have risen up like a thick, dark cloud. 
between us and God. We have no clear view of Him. We have no contact with Him. It's like Lamentations 3.44 says, Because of the sin, you have wrapped yourself with a cloud so our prayers cannot pass through. They hit the ceiling and they fall to the ground. You know, this helps us understand, at least in a small way, what happened to Jesus on the cross. Your sins have separated you from God. There is a reality on the cross. Jesus, because of our sin, cried out, My God, my God, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, why have you forsaken me? All of our sins were poured on Jesus. He became sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Every baby that has been slaughtered, that sin was put on Jesus. Every time we've lied, every time we've deceived, every time we've been a coward, every time we've refused to do something that matters. You know, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. All of that was placed on Jesus. And it was like God the Father, in a sense, turned His back on the Son because He could no more look on Him because His Son bore our unholiness. And yet at the same time, it was like God the Father looked right at Jesus But it wasn't the Lord, let His face shine upon you. It was the Lord pouring out the cup of His wrath on the Son. Jesus took the punishment for everyone who's ever committed an abortion. He took the punishment for everyone who has lied, everyone who has deceived, everyone who has stolen life and stolen things, everyone who has committed adultery, everyone who has blasphemed. He took our sins and the wrath and the punishment. He stood in our place as guilty sinners. He was totally innocent and He took it so we could be redeemed. And 1 Corinthians says this, chapter 6, Such were some of you. If you've been involved in abortion today, whether you are the man or you're the woman, I want you to understand that Jesus stood in your place. He was forsaken by God, so you don't have to be anymore. If you have been silent on this issue, Jesus has stood in your place. He has stood and taken your sins and your judgment on Himself. And 1 Corinthians 6 says, Such were some of you. But look, you can be changed. You are now washed. You are regenerated. You are made whole by the blood of Christ. And so today, Jesus offers forgiveness. Jesus offers freedom. He will set you free by His love. God demonstrates His love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Would you bow with me? In prayer this morning, if the praise team would make their way forward. Our God, we come and we repent of our sin. We repent of our failures. We repent of the sin of our nation. The murder that has been so prevalent. The shedding of blood that has stained us. We repent of our silence in the face of evil. Our God today. We pray for anyone who has taken part in abortion. For anyone who has encouraged abortion. I ask, Father, that you would cleanse them. That they could say, that was the past, that was me in the past, but now I've been washed and regenerated, made whole by the blood of Jesus. And Father, for those of us here who have been silent, who have been cowards, who have been afraid to speak the truth, I pray today, our Lord, that we would have a resolve this year, on this 41st anniversary of Roe vs. Wade, to be stronger and more supportive the weak and the innocent, like never before, that we would do something, that we would say something, that we would vote accordingly. But most importantly, we would do the personal work to make the difference by the power of your Holy Spirit. Be with us as we think now of Jesus bearing our sin on the cross so we could be forgiven. And we will give you the praise and glory as you work in this song of response. In Jesus' most excellent name and God's people say, Amen. Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist, and I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.